to hear from Marco Rodin. I first met him about 20 years ago, and he just absolutely captivated everyone. It was obvious at that time that he was one of the most brilliant young geniuses we'd ever seen in the field of mathematics. Last time he presented for any Tesla-related event was way back in 1992. His development at that time was called the Infinite Holographic Sunflower Map. Uh, I managed to get his book, and I still refer to it now and then. It's that good. Um, <coughs> at 17, he had the basic concept. He said it hijacked his life. And now he's calling it the toroid number map. And he has some equipment based on that that you're about to see. He's had peer review from uh, people at Microsoft, the University of Hawaii, Jonas Salk, and at General Dynamics. Also with him presenting is Jamie Buteroff. Um He's got a background in construction. He's invented several UL-approved life safety devices. And uh, he's known Marco for the past few months. He's also a consultant with the Pentagon. So we're going to start off with Jamie. Uh, doing some engineering demonstrations for us with Marco's equipment. Oh, I got, am I on? Yep. Okay, great. I'm going to need just for the speaker thing. Right? Okay. I'll need it later. All right. Hey, everybody. My name's Jamie. Um, we're not, uh, we weren't scheduled to speak at this conference uh, this weekend until uh, yesterday. So I wanted to uh, give everybody uh, my contact information in case you had any questions. I have a, um, a lot of information about the coil, how to build it. Um, so if you have any, uh, uh, if you'd like to know how to, how to build it, like some more information about it, some mathematical or some uh, scientific data that others have done, then uh, you can contact me and I'll, I'll be happy to send you some information. A um, little bit more background about me. <clears throat> um, like Michael said, I, I, uh, I come from a construction background. My experience, am I supposed to stay out of the, the lines here? <laughs> I'm sorry. My, uh, my background comes from... Uh, construction, like he said, I, I, I have a specialty construction background where, unfortunately, construction techniques today aren't as good as the ancients or back in uh, thousands of years ago. So the, uh, the construction uh, is, is needs a lot of help. So they call me in to fix problems, uh, solve situations, and that's what I've done uh, with uh, some of these life safety devices I've developed. Um, I moved on from construction after a spiritual awakening about 15 years ago and I decided I wanted to help people with my expertise and I could have consulted with the Chicago White Sox uh, I have held workshops helping people and I decided that one-on-one -on -one, small group really wasn't um, what I wanted to do anymore so I uh, six months ago I wanted to get into the area of energy I started looking at uh, hydrogen stuff and somehow I came across Marco's work on YouTube and I watched all 44 videos one Saturday morning, and I realized that uh, you know that was it. This was this was the thing that I wanted to start getting into. So, um, so with that said, I'd like to uh, bring up the uh, the first uh, the first JPEG of the uh, of his math. Uh, next one. There it is. This is the um, the the coil or the the math that Marco was talking about. I, I'm not going to get into it uh, too in depth. I just wanted to uh, show you exactly what uh, what he did, and then the coil that um, uh, the next frame, please, the coil that uh, uh, Bill Ramsey uh, put together. And I wanted to show you that this math that he mapped, how it converts into the um, uh, the Bill Ramsey coil, which is what you see here. This is one of the first. Uh, uh, rodent coils ever built and the coil that you see in this picture here is the exact same coil that uh, that I made uh, That's sitting uh, on the desk here. So uh, with that said, I'd like to go ahead and just uh, get started with some demonstrations um, I'm Turn on my meter Okay um, Let me go back. Let's go back to the, uh, the Coil Now before I get this thing fired up. I'd like to just briefly show you uh, demonstrate how this thing works it's a bifilier coil, which means there are two windings here, okay? Uh, the first winding is from here to here, which is actually 18 wires. And then the second winding goes from here to here, which is another 18 wires. And then the third winding, which is here, left blank, okay? I'll let Marco get into the math, but basically from here to here is a 174, yes? Can I, can I participate? 
this. Absolutely, right? come on the phone. Okay. Um, it's easy to do, and we do it because Here you go. because it's how we come from the knowledge. I came from it hard way up. It's harder actually now for people because they come with it after the fact. But Jamie would have known this. This is between me and Jamie. Jamie, you started with this one, you went to that one, and you made that the third. But as you know, you went around many times in Spires before you ever laid that wrap, and that one couldn't have been the second because it had to go around, I think, 15 plus, either 12. 12. It's 12. 12. Yeah. All so right. go, you know what to do for the correction? Yeah, okay, yeah, right. Okay. They, this has um, uh, been the problem when I explain this thing. When people say there's 18 turns there, well, that's not really correct. Um, there's actually there are 18, 18 wraps of wire in the thing. So what it is, I, I've broken down the, the coil in 360 degrees, okay? And I've made, uh, I've put 36 pins around here for a, a total of 36. So what, what you do is you start here and you start at the one and you come down here to the seven and the four and then the one, seven and the four and you keep going around and it actually ends up being 12 times before you come back to the, to the middle. So you or come back to your starting point again, okay? So that's what I consider one wrap. Right, so technically, I've gone around the coil 12 times, but I, I, haven't, I haven't duplicated the wrap yet until I get to the back to the top, which I call one, one turn, okay? So then I start again, and I go back around, and I come back to the middle, or come back to the beginning again, and that's my second wrap. So I do that until I get a total of 18 times. And then I start the second coil. Wait, Once that's all done, I start no, the second coil. I'm sorry, and if we couldn't do this if we weren't <laughs> like brothers. Okay, here it goes. The pair always has the space in the center. When you say that this is the, it's a bifurcated coil and this is one conductor and this is the second conductor, that's the shear, which is the outskirts. The, this is the first conductor. It's, it's stranded, which makes it confusing. It's hard to see because you can't see that this, there's a hidden, what's called a shear. There's a, a, an invisible boundary condition there. This is the other pair. These are the two. This has energy going this way. This has it going this way. And as these two, are going around, it's gone around many times before it ever lays here. A standard coil, anyway, I'm not going to go into the difference between a standard coil. Maybe you will later on, Jamie. But so this, co this right here, Jamie, maybe when you... No, I didn't bring it. Maybe because when you make it, you keep the two... When you make it, I have a question. When you make it, do you do these? No, you don't do these both at the same time. No. Huh. Okay. So you really can't have this one be the pair, a pair to that one because it's actually... Um, not coupled. It's really tricky because the everybody, this is a binary bifilar coil, but it's really not because it's based on thirds because of this gap space, which is critical for the higher dimensional magnetic flux fields to occur. And while it looks like this is a whole thing here and this is a whole thing here, it's just, it isn't. This is the pair. It goes around many times until it eventually lays right here. It goes around many times again before it goes right there. And that's why the electricity and the magnetism does things that they've never seen before. Right. I could explain it better, but right. thank you. Exactly. Okay. So what we're going to see right now um, is I've got this coil, uh, my coil hooked up to a signal generator. It's a, it's a dual channel signal generator. And I've got it 180 degrees out of phase with one another. So what they're doing is the, as the energy comes in to the center on the, on the first coil, or coil A, Right, then that stops, that pulsing will stop, and immediately the second coil will pulse going up, okay? That gives you, that gives you the shear, okay? So that's what, we're, that's what I'm going to demonstrate right now. So I get my uh, signal generator going. All right, my signal generator is on my laptop right here, which you guys can't see. It's coming out of my sound card and going into an amplifier, and then the amplifier is then the left and right channel comes out of that, and I have it hooked up to the coil. Because on a bifiler coil, you have actually four wires, okay? The starting of the first coil, then the ending of the first coil, then the starting of the second coil, the ending of the second coil, okay? So I've got my left and right channels hooked up right now. So let me get this thing started. And you can see, there we go. All right, you can see it's drawing uh, 1.42 amps, okay? And coming out of my amplifier, I'm not going to show you the, uh, the volts, but it's roughly five volts. So I have about five watts going to this coil, okay? So 1.41, everybody can remember that, right? Uh, I'm gonna, now I'm going to take a one inch by one inch uh, diametrically magnetized neodymium magnet. I have it mounted on a shaft. And the, the hole in the magnet is a quarter inch and the shaft is actually 316. So I have a little bit of play, which what this wants. Because technically, uh, some of the experiments I've done before with, uh, with magnets, the magnets will want to spin in three dimensions. Okay? 
not just linearly like what I'm going to show you here. They want to spin in three dimensions. So let me stick this in the center. I have to use these uh, rubber bumpers that I made to uh, shock dampening because, it, it, like I said, it wants to uh, spin in three dimensions. All right, so the draw was 1.41. Now, if we get this thing started, anybody hear that? Okay. Basically, you got a motor going, and I haven't I haven't increased my amp draw. We're still at 1.41. So now I have a, a spinning commutatorless, or actually self-commutating or brushless AC magnet motor, and and the magnet is spinning at I don't know hundreds of RPMs. It looks like I don't have any way of uh, measuring that, but. The amps have not gone up, so I have a spinning magnet that the amps have not gone up. Uh, the next thing I want to do, I built this uh, spinning magnet array. I actually had a bunch of, I, at one time, a couple of days ago, I just built this at the beginning of the week. And I had seven magnets arrayed. I got these little posts that I built. And because of the vibration and, and this little Mickey Mouse uh, design that I had set up real quick, it, it wobbled and, and uh, wobbled out the hole. So I'm only just going to show you this one magnet uh, setup uh, in my hand. So what I want to do is I want to spin this the opposite direction that's going. So I get my counter rotation, okay? See how the, see how the amps drop down? 1.35. It was 1.41. Now it's 1.35. Can you guys see that? Is my hand in the way? All right. Get the second one going. All right. There's no. There, the amps have not gone down. I got now. I have three magnets spinning, and the amps have gone from 1.41 where they started, uh, and they've gone down. All right. As I put more magnets around this array, uh, the amps continue to drop just a tad, but the the um, I'm getting a lot of mass spinning. And the, the point of this, and what I, want to, uh, what, I want to, what I want to express, is that I can array all these magnets around here. And if I were to take some pickup coils, or manufacture or make some pickup coils around this, uh, these, all these spinning magnets, what I would like to do is capture that energy off of all these spinning magnets and put it back into a closed system. Can you see? Okay. Focus. And there, away. How's that? What turns the thing in your hand? It's the uh, the rotating magnetic field. Uh, you guys can't see the magnet spinning, but there's a uh, the magnet is spinning in the center of the coil right now. What's the what's the orientation of the magnet? Pardon me? What's the orientation of the magnet that you have in your hand? The orientation. Um, I, I found the best way to, to get the amps to go down, I found the best way is to, is to put it in here at this particular angle. So I had these magnets all at, these, at this particular angle. Is that what you're addressing? Yeah, is that a pole, like a north pole or a south pole? Yeah, what it is, it's a diametrically magnetized magnet. So what that means is, what that means is, uh, this is a magnetic pole identifier, okay? So uh, if, I, if I turn it on, that's south. As I rotate this magnet around, it, tur it goes to north. Okay, then it goes back to south, it goes back to north. That's what diametrically magnetized me. So I don't have the north here and the south on the back side. It, it, okay. It, 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 it's magnetized radially then, right? Out, out from the axis. Well, the half of this magnet you this know, way, yeah. yeah. Would yeah, be split. Yeah, so this yeah, half we're, is, we're speaking yeah. apples and apples here. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I clicked on buy now, it said diametrically magnetized. That's all I know. <laughs> okay. All okay. right. I got it. Thank all you. Right. And Mark, we're just gonna have all right. So, um, Marco, do you want to add anything this to that? Don't open it. Thank you. Okay, so what this thing? You talking about this thing right here? I don't know. Zooming out. That's a, that's about it. Okay. All right. So um, my point is is that I, I am um, using five watts of energy uh, in the through the uh, pumping through the rodent coil, 180 degrees out of phase with one another. And I'm getting a, I can get all kinds of magnets to spin. And the, as I do that, the amps will go down. I wanted to show you one more thing, uh, just to, to show you uh, the uniqueness of this. I'm going to get it going again. Okay. Now, should go back up to 1.41. Actually, it's now it's 1.37. 
some reason. But if I put my finger on this, can you guys see? And I put some, um, put a load on it, or mimic a load. I'm just going to push on it. See how the amps go down as I put my finger on it more and more. So the more of a load, the more of a load I put on this, it seems to want to go down. So the idea, the idea being, because of the design and the increased and the tremendous magnetic field that's going on. Now keep in mind, I had a coil that I uh, I had earlier that uh, was a typically uh, typically wound toroidal coil on a ferrite core. It had 2,000 wounds of uh, 2,000 uh, turns of copper wire. The inductance on this coil uh, was almost a henry of inductance. The inductance on each one of these is only is 0.6 millihenries of inductance. And the very little wire and the windings that are on this thing is produces an, an enormous amount of focused magnetic field in the middle. And this is why I'm able to get this magnet to spin. This is why that it, it has enough torque to spin other magnets around it. So if I can put some pickup coils all around these, feed it into a system. Let's say, for example, I had a, an, an, a, an inverter that was running off of a battery. So the inverter was creating the 120 volts. And if I ran that and well, my equipment and, and pumped that into the coil, or ran the magnets, took the energy off of the magnets, and ran that back into the battery somehow, that would be a closed system, or somehow I could create an over-unity device. Now, I don't have the expertise uh, to do that. I'm not an electrical engineer. But uh, I just wanted to come here and show you and share you with you, um, at Marco's request, all the things that I've discovered in the last four months working with his, working with his stuff. But that's just one of the exciting things that I've discovered so far. Um, Marco, do you want anything to add while I... Uh... Uh, Jamie, could I ask you one quick question? Sure. One normally would expect, say, with a regular electric motor, if you were to put a load on it like that, mm -hmm. that the amperage would go up, right? So Correct. Correct. I mean, that's so what happens now. Yeah, just the opposite from what I'm experiencing so far. Yeah, I need that. Yeah, when well, we get ready to ask a question, raise your hand so we can pass you the mic. I, I told him not to. I told him to yell out. I've got to stop doing that. So, i got to stop doing that. <laughs> yes. Have you, ever, have you ever actually... Have you ever actually made it put so much drag on it that it stalled? Oh yeah, it, it stalls rather easily. Uh, rather easily. And it's still the the amps are down. Yes. It's reduced. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It'll 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 go to a stop. Oh yeah. One of the other things I wanted to point out. I'm uh, talking with uh, with a uh, friend of ours uh, about this design. Uh, right now, the, the application for this would be to create a a laptop fan motor. Okay. Because the you saw that when, when the current was flowing through the coil, we had 1.41. When I put a spinning magnet in there, they still remained about 1.41. So what you're doing is you, I'm spinning a magnet for free. It's not costing any energy, okay? So if you were to hook this up to a, a, a laptop motor, put a fan on it, you know, miniaturize it, of course, uh, you, would, you would basically be able to cool your laptop for free. So uh, this is a technology that I'm sure would replace every laptop fan motor, you know, in existence. Um, I'm not choosing to pursue a patent at this time because I want this, in I want this information to get out. This is important. You know, this is what I, I want to do. Like I said, I'm, I'm here to help people. I want the world to be free of crude oil and pollution, and this is why I'm here today in this conference to uh, show and demonstrate some of the miraculous things that can happen with this rodent coil. And, and keep in mind, this is very rudimentary. This is, not what, this is not what he has in mind as a design for the ultimate coil. Okay? This is just a, a proof of concept. Okay? All right, the next thing I'd like to do is I'd like to demonstrate something uh, rather unique and interesting. Where is that mic? I'm going to need that for a second. Thank you. Okay. What I've got now, I'm going to play you Billie Jean by Michael Jackson in tribute and memorial to our uh, lost fantastic musician. Okay. Make sure this is playing. Okay, should be playing right now. Now, obviously, you guys can't hear anything. I'm going to hold it. Well, see, I don't want to move that because I don't want you, I want you guys to be able to see this. So I'm going to hold it in my hand. Okay, testing one, two. This is on. You hear the clear sound out of that thing? Let's see if we can get some bass. It's a little tinny and the vocals, okay? And what I, what I would like to do uh, with, with this is actually replace the plastic donut. What's happening is the, you're getting, you're hearing 3D sound, but because the coil is not made properly, uh, you're, you're, uh, some of the vocals are getting lost, but what I would like to do is replace this plastic toroid here with a, say, a, uh, 
a starch, a hard starch uh, based co uh, toroid, wrap my coil around it, wrap my windings around it, and then once, it, once I'm all finished, I would dip it in some water and let the starch uh, dissolve. And then I would have basically a beautiful three-dimensional guitar, harp, instrument, you know, that would produce some ultimate, you know, fantastic 3D, 3D music. Okay? Can you guys hear me? Is this, is this, what, this thing on? Okay. You have anything you want to add to that? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I see. This thing's come off. Yes, Jamie. The, the sound that you wanted us want us to hear is like a. Is that I heard something of that, uh, to that effect? It's like a. I don't know how to really describe. It. It's like. Well, the sound I would like for you guys to hear is is actually three dimensional. I don't I don't know. Bose has been pretty much the leader and pioneer in the in speaker technology, and they've done everything they can to try and replicate three D sound. Normally, as we're sitting here listening to my voice, you can pretty much pinpoint where the speakers are. Correct. With a properly built Roden speaker, you wouldn't be able to figure out where the music's coming from. You wouldn't know, it, it's because it would be coming from everywhere. That would be the, the main thing with the Roden coil. Plus, the way it's designed, you could actually use, you could pump two channels, two separate channels into the coil at the same time, okay? So, pretty exciting thing as far as music, uh, music replication and sound is concerned. And I really thank you for making it and bringing it to existence. You're welcome, okay. All right, stop this. Uh, I'd like to show you one more thing. Uh, everything's in my way, it seems like. Get this out of here. All right, if you'd like to say something while I hook this up, you're welcome. I'm just going to disconnect everything from the, uh, the signal generator. I have a special box I'd like to hook up to it now. What I'm doing is I'm going to uh, I'm going to hook the two coils in, in this series right now. All right, inside the box, uh, I just have a crude uh, circuit board I made. It's just a um, a bridge rectifier. Uh, and it's plugged into 120 volts AC, and I have a light for a load because it, I only have like three or four uh, ohms of resistance in here, so it'd be like short circuiting. Uh, short circuiting, and so I have a load on here just to uh, keep that from happening. So what I do, what I want to do, is turn this on. Oh, that's not working. Is it plugged in? Okay. I'm going to turn this on. All right, get this out of the way. Uh, this is a just a regular carbon carbon shaft, carbon steel shaft, or just uh, steel that can be magnetized. Right now, it's not magnetized. I guess I need to put it here so you guys can see. This is a uh, magnetic pole detector that I showed you earlier. Okay, uh, let me show you on this. I show you on this one. Okay. You got the north there and the south. So the north turns uh, red and the south turns green, okay? And a regular magnet. When I uh, take the steel shaft and insert it into the middle of the, of the coil, I can hold it just the right way. I'm gonna show you. Uh, all right, can you guys hear me push the button, all right? I don't get anything on this side. But when I put it on the other side, I get a north, I get an emitting north. I get pulses of north magnetic energy coming in there. How's that? Can you guys see that? 
so hard. Can you hold this one? Well, like, like that maybe would be better. Yeah, just hold the. Uh, yeah, just hold it just like that right there. But if you want, just hold the coil, and I can hold the hold the rod. Or actually, maybe I can just sit it down in here again. How about that? How's that? Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Let me show you this again. I'll do it from the other side. I'll start over here. Okay. You guys see that? So I'm getting I'm getting north magnetic energy on one side of the steel rod. When I move it over to the other side, okay, there, there's no magnetic energy there. Um, direct current, yeah, it's pulse DC. I'm, I'm pulsing DC at 120 hertz right now. Okay, there is there is no magnetic energy. So right now with this with this coil, I'm able I'm able to magnetize a steel rod only on one end. Um, I'm not sure if you guys understand the significance of that, but as I was researching the, of my discovery of what I found here, I came across a paper by four prominent mathematicians, and they were talking about uh, magnetic dipoles and wormholes, and they said that uh, if, if, if you stuck a magnetic dipole at one end of a wormhole, the external observer would, would see a magnetic monopole. Okay? Now, I can't sit here and tell you that I've just discovered the, uh, a, a magnetic monopole. Obviously, scientists or physicists have been looking for the magnetic monopole for, for years. They haven't found one yet. They, have to, they use them in their equations, because that's what makes them work, but they haven't actually discovered one yet. Um, but I can't sit here and, and, and honestly tell you that I've discovered a wormhole or a magnetic monopole with a $24 detector. <laughs> All right, I'm just not gonna do that. Only thing I wanna do is I, wanna, I just wanted to show the anomalies from the from the music to a, whatever's going on with this, it's a uh, I'm able to you know, maybe it's folding the south energy somehow because of the uh, because of the math because of the design I don't know so I would like for other people other scientists to pick up this discovery look at what you know replicate this and and use that it's you know the uh, the instruments they have at their disposal to properly. Um, document and understand exactly what's going on with this coil because there's uh, a lot of anomalies that uh, I, I'm not able to explain and I'm hoping that you guys out there will be able to explain. So. Hmm? Oh, there it is. Okay, there it is. Yeah, there's the, uh, you, have, you have the names of the four math? Can you read it up there? You don't have that? Okay. So anyway, that's, uh, that's basically all I have for you guys this evening. I just wanted to uh, come here today and show you some of the things I've discovered and hopefully uh, we'll be able to figure out uh, what's going on and make some proper coils and move forward and we can get off of this, uh, this energy cycle that we've been on and start moving towards freedom. So with that, I thank you very much, and I'd like to turn it over to Marco Roden. Do you have another question? Sure, go ahead, yes. Well, just a, a little clar uh, clarification question. Can you look it up in series that break the microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Um, when, when you hooked the, uh, the coil up in series, uh -huh. you disconnected it, and you re uh, hooked it up to the 120 AC, did, did right. you do that so that, that it was still a bi-directional field there when you hooked it up in series? Uh, no, I actually, I actually uh, hooked it up so that all the energy is going into the center on both coils at the same time instead of, instead of creating shear. Oh, okay. 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 All, all right. right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right.
the documentation of this discovery possible from, and, and for the people who aren't here anymore who originally sponsored me, such as Bob Butlick, Dean Stonier, and tonight, I think, uh, Stephen Ellswick. Um, the next p image, that's a picture of me with the coil and the field produced on the left. Let's go to this image here, which is my logo. Um, a little bit higher up. This is my logo. Times divide plus and minus all in a circle. All the mathematical symbols together as one. Okay, thank you. Next image is going to be what we've been talking about. Um, this is um, I call the primal point of unity. That's where um, the zero is, and there's an emanation coming out of it. Um, this is three, six, they do not connect. They can converge on the nine. When nine is positive, three and six are minus. When nine is negative, three and six are positive. This is a coil, it's a circuit. All the secrets of mathematics are contained therein. This is the physical world, the third dimension. This is a higher dimensional flux field. It moves tangentially, it moves on a different axis. It's the fourth, it's the omni-fourth dimension. Uh, this is how, be it a solar system, water, air, any continuous medium, including electricity, will follow this pathway. Okay. This is a coil made by Bill Ramsey. Um, he called it the rodent coil. Um, I, by default, accept that. Let's keep going. I call it a flux thruster atom pulsar because of the fact that there's an emanation coming from it, that it's a reactionless drive, that it, no matter what weight you put into it as a spaceship, this is the nozzle. Uh, it's a positive one way. It's, it's an electrical venturi. Um, I'll go into it more. This is the emanations coming, activating the family number group uh, 369, positive 369, which are separated by negative 39369. Um, that's the gap space. These emanations are actually in thirds, they're tangential, so when this emanation is here, this emanation really is at a whole different reference position in space. It makes the coil into a gyroscope. Um, I've discovered the secret of gyroscopic spin. Okay, let's keep going. This is the coil turned on. That space in the center is a perfect tor uh, right there. That's a hole, I predicted that. Um, this is a magnetic field, that's the electrical venturi. It creates a negative negative space-time implosion. Um, it's uh, essentially a black hole, man-made black hole on a laboratory workbench. Uh, my voice is a little harsh. Can everybody still hear me properly? <coughs> um, that fractaling of the magnetic field has raised a lot of eyebrows, uh, the ferning effect. That magnetic field for the amount of copper and the amount of energy should not exist. I, I get tens of thousands of times minimum of more uh, of magnetic inductance. Um, it's because of the fact that there is an energy that is causing this magnetic field to appear, which is not electricity, but is actually a higher dimensional flux or spirit or monopole or whatever you want to call it, dark matter. Okay, let's keep going. We'll, we'll always come back in another way and describe it another way. This is called the, um, the toroid number map or Abha Torus. All these numbers are pieced together such that Every function, every known equation, every branch of math is combined into a to donut. Um, it's self-determining. I didn't pick the donut shape. It, it, it was the um, um, uh, only result that could occur. That's because that's the shape that energy survives and transforms and renews itself. Energy comes in in one way, comes out the other way only to return. It's because this is a heat sink. This is a hot spot. And this is the coolant system, how it works cycling out to the outer ergosphere, out the bottom, and taking it back in once it's cooled again. It's essentially like a, um, like a engine bathing itself constantly. That's what the stars, planets are. Um, this is maintaining its temperature. It has, even though uh, it's, uh, I don't know what, five tens of thousands of degrees Celsius, it cannot over exceed its temperature or it would incinerate. Even a black hole will burn itself out. It maintains a constant temperature by sucking in more planets, more stars. Is that me? Okay. Mr. Ronan. Yes. How is that, how is that principle in reference to life itself as human being life with um, the renewing and the regeneration and all this modeling in the universe? 
How do you mean exactly? Well, in terms of, in terms of uh, at the end of someone's apparent lifespan, and in how it turns into the process, the whole travel of the whole journey in life, not just technology. Um, I'll, I'll be brief, but I'll come back to it when we have a better illustration. Um, it's, we all, not all of us, some don't believe it, but the soul we believe is immortal, but I don't think that's the the crux of his question. Our bodies are made out of countless stars out of the past. We're made out of star stardust because um, eventually, um, because that's the nature of uh, matter. It's transformed, renewed, and purified by being sucked into this hole where it's heated up, churned together, and comes out as a gaseous uh, plume through space. That's what a um, pulsar is. Let's keep going and I'll come back to it. Um, this uh, Fibonacci prime number, Steve, go kind of quickly. Um, it's a lot of text. Keep going. Keep going. Stop. Well, this is an article done by Professor Scott Nelson. It's never been circulated to the public before. He discovered that the growth of plants are synonymous with the discovery of this math, the rodent coil and the coiling in life and nature. This, so the discovery isn't something that is only inert uh, material, but it's actually all, all existence takes the shape and form, even living beings. Um, and so in this paper, it's a very lengthy paper, I think we only did a few extracts. Um, we'll have to post it up online so then it can be reviewed and read in depth. It's, um, is, we keep on going, it, it essentially says that every part of the plant is uh, a mathematical template related to a prime number. And it's very lengthy. This is, oops, this is all done by Professor Scott Nelson at the University of Hawaii. Um, in, and uh, these are all done by him. It's a very massive work. It's a masterpiece, like all the work he does. I'll stop. Let's go back. We're actually cutting through a lot of his work and papers, but not that, a little bit further back. Um, one more image back, if we can. Okay, no, we went too far. Okay, go back to the Eye of Horus. Um, the Eye of Horus, it comes out of Egyptology or it comes out of Egypt. Um, it's broken down into um, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64 pieces. Um, the, in it, it, there's a very big significance to that. Um, and uh, occult, mysticism, uh, lost mm -hmm. civilizations, this secret that I've discovered has always been known whether it was shared with the general public is another thing. I think it was um, uh, kept secret because I, I believe that they thought that the general public would desecrate the secret. But it's it, the reverence they had to it, the holiness, and the, um, the, the significance of it, I think that they revered and honored it significantly. Usually that's put on people when they die. Um, I'll come back to Egyptology again with the next illustration. This is um, the rodent coil done by a book. Uh, has to do with the keys of Enoch. J.J. Hurtek uh, claimed that he was taken up by aliens into space. And while he was in space, he saw these huge rivers of light, of energy throwing, flowing through the universe. Um, I have no way of knowing if that's true or not, that that occurrence took place. But in the book, he gave forth that when he asked the aliens what it was, they said that that was the electromagnetic grid for the universe, how energy is distributed. Uh, the, naturally through, through space. And they gave him uh, this mathematical code of these, six, of these nine numbers to, uh, that said this was the code for it. Now, Professor Nelson has mastered my work. He's, he's put in, uh, I don't know, uh, 50,000 hours of study. I don't know if that's humanly possible, but it's massive, uh, exhaustive research. And he has, thus he's very adept, and he has the skill and the ability to know what to do. And he took these numbers, he put them on a tile, and he knew what number would go where and laid it out based on the doubling circuits and the 3966, the gap space. But what happened is, is that he had different faces of a pyramid. He did not expect to have this, uh, different sides. Um, I won't explain all the mathematics, but there's a significance to the multiplication series on the corners. There's significance of the doubling circuits in 693 and how it worked. I, I won't take a question on it, even though there might be some, just because um, 
It needs to be published and it needs to be, have a lengthy discussion. It, the picture's here, the numbers are here, and it can be studied for greater depth and review. Again, it's four rodent toruses making a pyramid because of the doubling circuits. The number pattern changes at a right angle when it hits the vertex or corners. Um, it's a very significant work, believe it or not. Okay, please, it's a whole other approach. It shows that the torus has a relationship to the pyramid. That, that's what I always try and do. Try and take, a con make a connection that comes from out of right field that instead of um, proving just something new, it actually ties together everything else that's old that we knew and takes it to a whole nother, um, um, I guess, uh, um, horizon. Okay. Let's see if we can go to the next one. Uh, this is the article he wrote about it, The Seal of Solomon, A Mathematical Key to the Great Pyramid. And it's a lengthy article. Let's keep scrolling but it's a definite must read. And he describes how he did it. I asked him to do that and he was very kind and went into great depth and explained the significance. We'll go kind of quickly. So this is a professor, this is somebody independent of myself who approached it from a different angle and a whole new avenue. Okay, and this is a letter. This is just the, the correspondences we had when he first revealed it. Okay, we're on a whole nother stop right here. This is a whole different um, work and from a different person. Um, this is showing that, uh, that the next base system after base 10 is base 26. That's because base 10 is made from the first true prime number 3 squared, which is modular 9, base 10. This is the next torus. This is a, a map. Um, and that's modular 25, base 26. In this case, the torus has still just one gap space where the magnetic field and the inertia, ether, spirit flux is concentrated, but it has, in this time, it has four circuits instead of two. That means that there's other ways to make the road and coil. That means that there's other base systems. You can have, instead of 36 wraps, you can have 36,000 wraps. But bear in mind, I don't believe personally in using stranded wire. When I say wraps, that's wraps of each circuit. I actually uh, believe that, there's, that the conductors um, are actually a single um, continuous medium and not stranded. Um, and there's more to know about the conductors, but this is done by uh, Farron Thorpe, uh, a brilliant teacher and professor. Let's keep going. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit more. So what this means then is that the only true base counting systems are based on prime squared. They, um, they they reveal that all mathematical calculations, fun functions, uh, mathematical relationships must be inherently exist to make a torus, to make a base system. If it doesn't make a torus, it is not a base system because it leaves um, blanks, holes, it leaves appendages, uh, uh, broken calculations. So base 10, I mean base 12, base 15, uh, whatever you do, even, even hexadecimal is not a true base system. Um, okay, let's keep going. And it would not make a coil. So that means there's also another base system. Here's base 50. 7 times 7 is modulo 49. So to get torque to create uh, inc spaceships, incredible power, and coils. Thank you. Um, as the, what you saw to ramp up the principle of the effect, to, get, to make these so that you can make a hovercraft or make a spaceship, there's nothing to it. <clears throat> it's, just, it's just knowing the relationship, the winding, how to weave it, how the conductor, how the energy flows. Um, there's more, as you go higher, there's more things to learn, more things to know, but that goes with the, 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 the application. Um, I will say this, I would like to talk about the conductor and about the field, but I'm still not going to do it here. In fact, for this presentation, I wish I had better illustrations showing how to wind the coil. This, but I can't do it with a 2D view. So let's keep going. And so we're going to go quickly through Farron's work now. Now we're at DNA. Um, um, I'm go I don't want to come back to this, so I'm just going to not go deeply, but I'm just going to say that those dark lines are half. It's wrapped around the other side of an underpinning nested vortice. Um, this, vortice, this one's positive, this one's negative. The boundary conditions are aligned. 
It's not easily discerned there. It's not the best illustration, although it is accurate. Let's keep going. This has to do with the DNA. Let's stop right there. A little bit higher with that, please, just so it's, yeah. Um, it's very significant here, okay? DNA kind of is the, um, the holy grail of, of evolution and of our science. These are two circuits, just like the rodent coil, the torus. This, this is not the pair. The pair or the, it always has the space in between it. So it's not blue-red here, it's blue here, it's red here, and it's green in the middle. This is the pair. And the pair is displaced, it's being distended. Okay? It's called the major groove in DNA. The groove is here. Okay? This is the major groove. The minor groove of DNA is over here. It's actually where the backbones come closest together. It's a shear, a harmonic shear. When I work with it mathematically, it always makes the same value. It's essentially, this is the equation for infinity. Um, it's infinity, though, that's not infinite. It's a bounded infinity. By being infinity, what infinity defines is that it's, it's always self-similar, self-recurring. It, um, it never varies from that pathway. I know that's a little obtruse, but this is the morphogenetic field of the bioetheric template. This controls evolution. This higher dimensional flux field controls all cleavage and receptor sites. The underpinning nested vortices align. I wish I had the illustrations I look for. I'm showing how they cause mitosis and sister strand unraveling. But still, this means, by my viewpoint, that Darwinism is obsolete, it's false, and that creationism is wrong. This is an all coherent, higher dimensional flux field. It's spirit combined with magnetism. It's how information is retained and preserved. It will be the, the data storage processes of the future. You can end any disease. You can produce unlimited food when you understand the relationships. Um, okay, let's keep going. So DNA is by failure too. Um, so we're covering lots of um, topics and different things. This is the Enneagram. It's, I always get asked it, or we gave a talk the other day, and somebody asked a question. I didn't answer it very well, and I wanted to pull up this illustration. So here's the three and six, not connected, but connected only to the nine. Normally in the Enneagram, they're connected at the base. My position is that's false. Here is the classic Enneagram shape. Uh, it's done with multiples of one or, or eight on a circle, and you got the uh, dividing by seven, one, four, two, eight, but that's not the point. The point is, is that um, this shape, it has a relationship to a circle. And next I'm going to show that this shape and the doubling circuit, which we've already seen, that infinity symbol, and the torus, which we've seen, that this is connected in a part of it. So let's, I don't know if we're going to go to the next illustration. Or maybe we will. Let's see it. I don't know if I was clear. Yep, I think we've got them in order. Okay, let's stop right here. So. The text is too complicated. I'm glad to be here to explain it. This is the surface of the torus skin, this number pattern. I'll pull it up in a minute. So it's going to have to be 8, 3, 4, 7, 9, 2, 5, 6, 1. Then it'll flip. It's really, but that's not what we're pointing out now. Wait, 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 come back. What happens here is now I am making up this shape of the integram, which you've already seen, which you recognize, which comes from the doubling circuit. It's no longer dividing by 7. It is the number 1, the number 2 the number four, the number eight, the number seven, the number five. It's a whole different number pattern, the same geometric, the same template of the Enneagram. Very, very, very significant um, that there's a, 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 a thread, a tie-in to other geometric shapes. Um, that, in other words, it, they're, they're commensurable. Uh, in geometry, they have what's called the incommensurability of geometry. They can't tie all the different things together, the platonic solids, the different geometric shapes. So let's see if I can pull the torus skin. Remember this pattern at 1, 6, 5, 2, 9, 6, which seems a ridiculous pattern, 7, 4, 3, 8. So let's see if we have a, a torus coming up. Well, uh, no, we don't. Let's go backwards. It's a lot to ask of you, Tyler, but find me the torus map with the number. I know no request is too big for you. Hmm? Here we have it. Um, pull it up a little higher. Thank you for finding it, Tyler. 
It's very blurry. You can't see it. Does anybody remember the number pattern? It's too bad the resolution is low. Yell it to me. One, six, five. Is that correct? Uh, what's that, a two? That's a four? Wish <sighs> It's really inappropriate how blurry it is. This is the pattern that we just saw that was making the integram. It's reversed. Here's the doubling circuits. Here's the ninth. But counter diagonal to that is always the pattern of the integram. I know it's going to be one, six, five. I can figure it out. Yep, it's a two. The pattern's got to be a nine. I can figure it by the doubling circuits in the gap space. Here's an eight. That's got to be a seven. This is a two. That's um, a four. Um, that's a six, nine. That has to be a three. And this is a one, five, seven. That has to be an eight. So that is the pattern that we just saw. If we scroll down, we'll see it again. Let's go back to that last integram before we then go to the next topic. That the last one. That is the pattern. One six five two nine seven four three eight. It's a part of the torus skin. I call it a skin because it's a surface topology of a torus. Bear in mind that now I'm combining the surface topology, a line, a circle, a multiplication series, all these different seemingly uncorrelatable branches of math and, and approaches are really all part of the same thing. Just different views, different understandings. In other words, I found the missing link to everything through the symbol and through positioning the numbers on the torus map properly. Okay, let's keep going. This was, um, this was something we've talked about. We all really get worked up about it. It's um, that I should do a pilot math program in schools and that this was a grant that was written for me. Keep on going a little bit further. Um, by Donna, not by Donna Estimago, but by Maggie, whose name's not here. Oops, stop, go back up to it then. They wanted me to teach a form of math in their schools to teach arithmetic to children differently. Um, I take the multiplication, I really take the mirroring significant because it's exciting and it's different that everything has a reflection. Um, I'll give you an example of it. I have a way to teach children arithmetic that, it, that gives them an excitement and enthusiasm and it's um, outrageously different. It has to do with black holes and, um, and fun. Okay, next. I have this here because um, part of the, where I'm speaking here today at the Tesla conference, um, who was hosted by Stephen Ellswick, and he had the first sessions were on biology. And I, um, I feel honored and privileged to talk, and I, I want, of course, biology medicine is, is the king of sciences. The healing sciences is the most important. And this is um, somewhat to me of a primitive device. It's called a radionic device. Uh, it's not medically approved. In fact, uh, there was millions of dollars of them sold and the FDA just required them to be recalled. But what is significant is, is that my coil they find to be critical to the functioning of this device because when my coil goes on it, it intensifies it, it changes the magnetic field, it literally transforms it. And it's on all of the devices made by this company. Um, how they got a hold of it probably was by seeing other people using it and I guess what they say is that um, copying is the highest form of flattery. The coil is not made very well. It's um, a single strand because no, but I've never really gone to detail what is significant. This really, this, this space here should have all been copper. It shouldn't have been big spaces like that, but they're just, they don't have my input. Let's keep going. I, maybe I can come back to that better another time. This is my work on DNA. This was from the German Journal of Oncology. Let's keep going. A little bit lower. Um, why am I showing this? Um, as I was discussing with Don, the first half of my life they thought I was delusional, that I did not have my marbles. Because I was, because, because how could I figure out a language that doesn't exist or relationships that aren't already known? But this is the German Journal of asking to publish my work. He's very supportive, Dr. Hans Nieper, so I've done the best to get um, testimonials saying I recommend your paper for the publication of the German Journal of Oncology. The best testimonials I think when it relates to my work is from is the ones I've already shown you except I haven't shown you the one from the senior researcher from Microsoft yet so let's see where that is. 
oh, this happens to be here. I just want to show the relationship of DNA to a torus. These are the underpinning nested vortices, and they're staggered by a third. That is very, very significant. They just discovered on airplanes that by 2012, they believe they'll have it in, 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 uh, available for the market, that by texturing the skin of the airplane, they can save 40% of the fuel consumption. It's called waggling. I don't know where they came up with that term. Probably it's because they observed it maybe in biology, I don't know. But I predicted a long time ago that the surface topology, by having underpinning nested vortices, that you can get rid of all resistance. In my case, for coils, I say that it makes electricity, um, it creates what's called the longest mean free path of least resistance. It creates what I call synchronized electricity. Um, essentially, it's a electricity that um, you're not forcing to do things. It, wa it knows where it wants to go and it goes there naturally. Okay, let's keep going. Um, okay. This is um, a student of mine. Now, it sounds that I'm being um, derogatory of this person or diminutive by calling him my student um, or even being haughty or pompous. But he never he told me that when, well, after he took my classes, he said if anybody had told him about this before he took the classes, he said he would have said it was impossible. Okay, who is he? Senior researcher, advanced Microsoft. Uh, he, he put in this resume. He gave me his resume to use. He said he created the Winstone Industry Standard Benchmark, author of the book Optimizing Windows NT. What is more significant than this resume is that he was willing to allow me to give credence to what I do. That, that's hardcore. Um, I, don't, I don't throw around my reputation easily. Okay, he worked at Sun Microsystems, Director of Operations, Software Products Division. You can read the rest yourself. He worked at Adoptive Intelligence Corp, Vice President, Engineering. He was Solaris Computer Company, Vice President, Software Development, Tandem Computers, Inc., Manager of Software Performance, Quality Future Vi Systems Division, Hewlett Packard, Project Manager, Performance Modeling, I would say that we just covered pretty much who's who. And I forget who mentioned this the other night, uh, but w when I gave a talk uh, in Sedona th last week, someone pointed out that he had an MS computer in science, Masters of Science, that is, in computer science in 1972 from the University of Wisconsin. And the person said, I didn't know that they were giving out degrees in computer science in 1972. I will say this, for me to have the opportunity to teach Russell Blake, as well as Farron, and as well as Scott, and um, you don't know what it's like to teach people like this. Um, uh, it's like um, you wouldn't want to mince words with them. You wouldn't want to clash swords with them. They acquire and assimilate the information spontaneously. Um, I teach them in an hour. They don't ask questions. They're already leagues ahead of me. They have mental faculties that far exceed mine. Just because I discovered this doesn't mean that I could even be compared to them. Just as I'm speaking at the Tesla conference, Tesla was an engineer that I could never compare to. I just have an ability to find the answers for what I want to know for difficult questions. But I, I leave it to Jamie and other people then to apply this answer. I could not be doing what Jamie is doing right now. I don't have the strength. I don't have the, the, the support system in place, mentally or physically. Anyway, we'll keep going. That's his resume. I think I should uh, read his testimonial. Let's see where we're at. Um, OK, we're going to go to, we just looked. This is his uh, testimonial on my work. Now, the reason I'm reading this is because this is all I got. I don't have a PhD. I never went to college. In fact, I, I graduated eighth grade because I didn't attend. The principal made a deal with my dad that if I did, told my dad that if I did go to graduation, they wouldn't graduate me. I never really made it past seventh grade. I got a high school diploma, but my teacher, when it was time to graduate, said I, he didn't think I was ready. He kept me for another year. I kind of just got the diploma just as a, as a, as, as a formality. Um, I, by then, I had already made this discovery. I had refused to do anything but think about it because I made it in my sophomore year of high school. This is a testimonial. Um, this took me from being conjectural and wishing to validating my work. 
because as you can see, nobody has a resume like Russell Blake in computer science and mathematics. It says he composed all these letters himself upon, to, to, to try to progress this discovery. He says, two years ago, I met Marco Rodin through mutual acquaintance. Mr. Rodin shared some of his results with me at that time. It became clear to me that Mr. Rodin's work was a synthesis of numerical patterns which had, been, which had previously been overlooked by conventional science and mathematics. That was my claim. But how could I back myself up that I had made a breakthrough in math at 17 that did not exist, that I was the first and only, that five billion people didn't know what I knew. In hopes of bridging the gap between Mr. Rowan's discoveries and conventional science, I put forth an analytical framework in which mathematical formulae generate the numerical patterns of the Rowan torus. These formulae suggested that the Rowan torus I never even heard the term rodin torus until I used it. People just have to um, create the vocabulary to describe what's going on as we do it. Uh, the formulae suggested that the rodin torus lies not just on the surface of the donut shape, but into the interior as well. That has, is impossible for modern science to do. No one can do that. In other words, the, tor the rodin torus is three-dimensional. Why is it three-dimensional? Not because it's just into the interior as well, but because of the fact that for me to have a surface topology, it has to be three-dimensional, okay? To have a donut, it's three-dimensional. But no one can model the z-axis perpendicular. In other words, I can see through everybody that there is something like a sparkler. A sparkler giving off sparks all over the place that is literally creating the numbers on the torus. That's literally... Um, creating the surface topology that's causing that torus to warp and return. That's causing every tile and every number to be positioned perfectly in relationship to the center. In other words, the torus is like a faceted Swarovski crystal, okay, that's made to be on fire with light because every one of those facets are literally imbued with life by this sparkler light that's coming from the center. I'll keep on going. Let's take it up just a little bit so I can read at eye level, please. <clears throat> Thank you. This is a short letter, really. This mathematical formulation is as yet incomplete, and the physical meaning of these numerical phenomena remain unexplored still. Yet in my career, I have several times discovered new mathematical formulations which have led to new products. In the late 1970s, I discovered atomic modeling which revolutionized computer performance modeling, measurement, and sizing. In the early 1990s, I discovered new ways to express the time-dependent behavior of program code, which led to reductions of program code size of 50% of the original size for all programs for which it, to which it was applied. I mention these facts merely to convince the reader that my intuition has a history of success in the practical application of new mathematics. Now, I am completely convinced, can I get a better testimonial? That the road in Taurus will likewise lead, look at this, he's literally putting me on his shoulders and, and, and catapulting me ahead, lead to new and revolutionary advances in art and science. What else is there than art and science? Mr. Rodin's work has suffered from a lack of adequate scientific attention, and I'm sure that as the research momentum builds in the proper relationship, I'm just having trouble writing a thank you letter, let alone, <laughs> let alone like this, and the proper relationship between the Rodin Taurus and conventional science that's right, conventional because it doesn't, this math doesn't exist in their world, in our world, other than what I'm sharing tonight or have I shared to my other students. Conventional science is fully understood. Both areas of endeavor will attain new heights. I'm very much looking forward, and he did, to playing a role in this adventure. He, he, he had never written maybe the next paper. This, a lot of this, this all happened in the very early stages, really. Uh, let's keep going. Let's see. Um, sure, that's fine. This is, um, by now he was living, when I met him it was in Kauai, where I was and he was living. By now he had left for, he had gotten married and had moved to, on a boat that he had bought and retrofitted with bigger gas tanks, was taking his new wife and stepchildren, four sons, um, on a world cruise. And he wrote this paper. I talked to him long distance by phone. I told him I was talking to 
people that were essentially saying that they could give me the financial resources to do anything I wanted, to make spaceships, to end diseases, to make unlimited electricity, which I know how to do if I was given the opportunity. Um, so I asked them to discuss the different applications and uses. It's too long of a letter, I'm not going to read it, we'll just skim through it. We'll just go through it. So he discussed evolutionary applications. He whipped that out in a day. Yeah, we'll just, we're not, I'm not going to read any of it. We'll just cruise through it and we'll just speed read it. Motors, um, antennae, by then already the four corners, transformers, electromagnetics. By the time this had been done, I already had my antennas had been protecting the four corners of the United States. Revolutionary applications, theoretical issues, and I'm not against the military. Probably I, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the military. But, you know, this is my baby. I would like to see it first applied to something more that, that saves lives. And of course, the military saves lives. I don't have reverse prejudice against the military. It's just that I know that they wouldn't let me share this work. I know that it would be classified. I know it would be proprietary. So they force my hand. I have no other choice than to be a rogue and do this stuff independently. It's not because I choose to take this path. Okay, so there it goes. Keep on going. And now we'll go to this. <clears throat> okay, let's stay, no, let's go right to the title. Because everything past this page is going to be too hard for us. I will stop at page 83 where he mentions that, a statement. But we're not going to try and read this, but I'm going to explain what this means to my life, okay? All the work that I've done, all the mathematics is, is bizarre number patterns, saying there's relationships. And right now, you don't really have much evidence or proof of anything I'm saying means something. What he did is he took my work and he said, I wanted to be a bridge. I wanted to bridge the gap between your discovery and the rest of mankind. Because he said he knew they could, <laughs> without him, no one would know what I'm saying. So he, he volunteered, he says, I want to be the bridge. He says, let me do this for you. It was a big burden, I've been trying to do it all my life. He took it on and had it done. I said, discussed it. He was telling me he hadn't had it done by the next morning, and by the next afternoon it was finished. Something I've been trying to do all my life. He translated my work into algebra. So here it is, the following is an attempt to formalize the mathematics of the road and torus. This goes to attain a higher level of understanding of the road and torus that can, than can be obtained merely by observing the numerical sequences generating the torus. Key to the development, of the use of Key to the development is the use of decimal parity. In other words, I'm just counting with my fingers but in science it's called decimal parity. Decimal parity is an operation that sums the digits in a number repeatedly to yield a single digit, the decimal parity digit for the original number. And he gives a kind of a prelude foundation background, but we're not going to read it. Let's scroll to page 83. You'll see how beautiful it is, and this is math algebraic mathematical language. I can't, I can't read it myself. I don't read algebra. I didn't make it that far in school. Okay. I will say this. Stop just any place. When I shared this with um, certain mathematicians that I had respect for and are very intelligent men, I was surprised that they couldn't read it. I don't, to this day, since I don't read it, understand why. Um, I do know that um, when I lived, when I wrote my original book with Fred Nava, and who was a seismic engineer, he, I learned that the calculus, you, the symbols in calculus that he used in seismic engineering and physics when it was used in chemistry or if it was used in, 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 in other branches of science, that the symbols had new nuances or had new um, meanings and, and bearings. So we tend to think that these symbols are universal in their meanings, but there is certain fluctuations in them. And what's most important to me is that when I share it with different people, with t teachers or professors or engineers or whatever, they actually had, they had trouble jumping and reading it and understanding it from another field. And I found that very interesting. It's just one more limitation of our languages today of math, of calculus. Um, I mean, I don't speak calculus, so I may not be doing a perfectly accurate depiction. Um, but calculus is doomed to op obsolescence, no matter how high we revere it and how important it is today. Okay, let's keep going. Page 83. So here he's doing all this stuff. I think it's page 83. Um, okay, let's stop. 
Well, no, keep going. I thought that was it. Stop. Well, keep going. Here it is. That's it. Stop. Come back, please. Just a bit that more. Go up. Go up. No, no, no. Reverse. Stop. I just want to, I like to see it right here. Please. Thank you. So bring it down just two inches. I want the whole, oops. Go up. Okay. It's not easy, I know. That's the sentence right here. It's italicized. He did that, not me. Essentially, he's screaming and yelling at us. He says, thus, each element is locked into place by being a member of no less than six series at once. And this is his comment. This is no small amount of regularity. Everybody, everybody who has ever evaluated my work, no matter for whatever reason they had to say it, because of me or because of the math, always said that this is, the math is, always works because I have, it's self-regular. It has self-regularity. It has, it has, it's, it has perfect, it is, it has coherence. It's, it has perfect coherence. What that means is that it is um, perfectly in tune, that everything is dovetailed together. It's like a pot, fine piece of furniture, that it is, um, that it is, is actually a completed creation. Something that can be looked at like a zebra or a tiger or an elephant. And so this torus is something to see because it isn't just a donut, okay? Our body is called the human torso. A tornado, all based on this shape, how energy moves, is more powerful than a nuclear bomb. Sure, I work for peace. Sure, that's my goal. That's why I've presented this work in the most positive and beautiful way that it can be presented with illustrations and numbers and applying it to med medicine and graphics and illustrations, anything and everything eventually can be and probably will be abused, okay? There's nothing more powerful than the Taurus, okay? That's why California's utility electrical plants all use toroid coils to generate their electricity, okay? So this is the, the paper written by him. Uh, take six elements at once. Russell Blake again said, he thought it was impossible. In other words, I can come top down, bottom view, front back, and from the inside out. And that's how spirit moves. Okay, so I guess we're done with this. It goes on, but we don't have to bother. Let's go to the next document. Okay, now. Oh, then we're almost done. This is the shortest talk I've ever done. Can you believe that? Um, oh no, we're not, are we done? No, we haven't done, where were we? Blake, Nelson, Farron, DNA, we've covered all this. I haven't done the Fibonacci sequence. Hold it for one second before we, no, go back. Well, let's see what we have left so we know when we'll be done. We have the Fibonacci sequence. We did this, did this, did this, did this. Yeah, we have two left, seven and 12. So the only reason I'm doing the Fibonacci is because it's just one more mathematical thing, enigma. Everybody sees it a certain way. In fact, there's endless. The Fibonacci Journal gets um, endless submissions of new people finding new Fibonacci relationships. That's why it's significant. All I care about is that before, you don't even move it for one second. Let's leave it weird, half cut in half. I say this. I say that this coil this lazy eight infinity pattern, which I said is always self-repeating. Energy, everything always takes the shape. Bear in mind that when it doesn't take the shape, it's because it's under-accelerated or it's, it, it, it isn't in its ideal maximum potential. But I am modeling everything based on its ultimate reality, okay? Because I've reverse engineering things. I'm not experimenting. I started with the answer. I'm applying it to our problems and what our mankind's needs today in energy and technology. So here is the Fibonacci sequences, which are well known. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55. Back to my original point though, is that the doubling circuits and the gap space, which is the higher dimensional mag magnetic spiritual flux field, which is the, the circuits are 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5, and the magnetic field is 3, 9, 6, 6, 9, 3, which no one even barely comprehends what that is today, okay? must exist in everything. If it doesn't exist in it, 
then my discovery is false because nothing can have an existence outside of this discovery. I am irrefutably making that statement. So I reduce this Fibonacci sequence to a discrete number sequence. That's the bottom pattern. I take it as a circle. It's one of my favorite things to do. I evenly space it all the way around. And then I look for the circuits. Every fifth element. One, two, four, eight, seven, five. Here is it in the opposite direction. One, two, four, eight, seven, five. I thank Rick for helping me with this illustration. Here I have the 396693. I make it dotted. For the first half of my life, I used to make it a solid line. Not until I got the help from other top excellent engineers did they figure out that the 396 is not a part of the 124875, that it is a field, that it is, it is a, a higher dimensional energy than the other numbers. It was a miraculous accomplishment by Scott Gosler. He made many discoveries in assisting me with developing this into the product that it is now. Okay, that's the first Fibonacci sequence. Well, there's many more. So let's scroll down to the next one. And I'm only doing this because someone brought up, well, I don't know what you're going through a lot of them, but it doesn't matter. Just stop at the one we're at. Is this a different one? Yeah, it's, it's starting with three instead of two. So one, three, four, seven. Plants use this for growth. Um, the, the, if you have two rabbits, they can predict the number of rabbits you have after 20 generations using the Fibonacci sequence. Again, I take it and d reduce it to a discrete number, put it around a circle, and you don't think there's not going to be two circuits going in opposite directions with a gap space in them. There is. One, two, four, eight, seven, five, and three, nine, six, six, nine, three. And if there's more, we'll show it. Otherwise, we're finished with it. There's more, we may have gone through it, but it doesn't matter. No matter what, it's always there and it's always right. Here's another one. Which one was that? It doesn't matter. You guys get the point. And this can be for any mathematical, what do you call it? Priori mathematical. They're called fixed constants. Um, I will say this. Each one is solved a different way. Each one is revealed a different way. Each one takes a special focus and, and approach to solve it. Where are we are. Then let's skip this. Let's be done. Let's go to the video, the last video. Okay. Um, the machines and technologies that could be made out of this, by next year I hope there's many more. It's kind of, I hope to be like an a, a, a avalanche, like a snowball. Um, this, let's turn the volume up to max. It may be loud, but I want you to get an idea of the speed, and it's going to be only halfway through the video that it starts happening. It's self explanatory but I want you to see the speed that with just a few turns, and with just uh, very little input of the capacity of speed, velocity, and you can hear it. And believe me, I could make a spaceship. It's a long video but it's worth it. This is from YouTube. The topic is rodent coil demonstration and rodent coil effects. And thank you for being such a patient audience with me and it's been a pleasure sharing with you. Two things, when you're this far back here in front of the speakers, it's gonna feed back. Um, Jamie, yeah. could you come up here for a second, please? Where's the portable mic? Yeah, he'll come and get it. Would you do the honors of describing? You can do it much better than me. What's transpiring? Well, what it looks like he's doing, he's, um, I haven't really studied the Vedini circuit, but what it is is a, it's a pulsing circuit. Um, much like uh, what Tesla does with uh, capacitors and coils, creating a resonance. And Jamie, you won't say it, so I'll say it for you and tell me if I'm wrong. If, I'm, if you don't say I'm wrong. 
wrong, then I'm right. If, if you had a million dollars, could you solve, could you make inventions that could do miraculous things to solve? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question. Of course, I don't have the engineering background to actually make them myself. But, you know but yeah, I, 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 I have the, the, I have the, yeah, they have the idea of what, uh, what needs to be done. I'll tell you what he has, everybody. He has something that you couldn't get from any GE or, or uh, Boeing engineer. You know what he has? He has the mindset, and that you can never find in another person elsewhere. Thank you. See, he's just using, uh, that's the Bedini coil right there. That's not your coil. Right. So I just like the general public. I go to YouTube, I type in my name or the coil, and I find out about this too, just like you. There it is, it's there, new thing. Thousands of new things, new pages. Because I, I haven't patented anything, I haven't copyrighted anything. Russell Blake, uh, Tom Dawson, any one of these people, they were contracted by General Dynamics. I can't get them to sign a contract or non disclosure statement. They're not, they're not, they're obligated to these companies. They're not allowed to use their name to endorse something. Okay, so how did I get around this to get the best mind to, to, to do, to address my work? I removed all barriers. I didn't ask anything from them whatsoever. Uh, what he did just then, he just uh, discharged the capacitor so he wouldn't uh, fry himself. This is the good part. So right now what you've just seen is, is, uh, is what it looks like in a regularly wound coil. Now he's going he's gonna to replace it with a, uh, with a rodent coil. You see how he had to jump start that magnet? See, had, I don't know if you guys saw that or not, but he had a little magnet on the side that he took it and swiped it with his hand to get it to spin. No, I didn't see that. Yeah. Is there any way you can bring that back just a second? No, it doesn't. It's not necessary. You better not. Because okay. He, well, well the, well, the point is, is that uh, he's, I don't think he's actually uh, pulsing it the, the way that I was pulsing it here, 180 degrees, because when I started mine, it just it self starts. He had to actually swipe a magnet by it to get it to spot, start spinning. See, and he also makes the, the point right there that if he doesn't flip the, if it doesn't work, he has to flip the coil over. Uh, this is what I was showing with the, uh, the, the last demonstration with the, the monopole, how you're getting a magnetic field on one end and not on the other. And I'm going to say this quick. That's because the coil waves are different. Even the weight is different on one side than the other. Look at that acceleration. My friend Rick thought it was going to explode. <laughs> yeah. We are in control of the broadcast. And we'll choose what you see. It sounds like the outer limits. Yeah. These are these are PMs are the same. Uh -huh.
Okay. I, I just wanted to say one more thing, uh, real quick. I just wanted to give you one little story about, you know, Marco's been doing this math, and I want to just give you just a quick story. Uh, the coil that's here, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, the plastic donut is actually a Fisher Price rock stack from, uh, that I bought on uh, Amazon. So I ordered the, the, uh, the wire and the, and the Fisher Price rock stack uh, from Amazon all at one time, and the UPS package came, and uh, I was all excited. I ran into my office and started ripping the package open. My girlfriend walks up to me, or walks in and says, uh, what are you doing? And I pull out this Fisher Price thing and I look at her and say, Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna make free energy. <laughs> and she says, Do what? <laughs> well, uh, I didn't really explain to her what it was I was doing. I was so excited, I saw Marco's stuff and I wanted to figure out how I could make this, saw some YouTube videos, ordered a bunch of stuff, and uh, started building building things. I was just so excited, I knew what I had, but uh, I didn't really fully understand the math. But I wanted to build something and uh, and to uh, just and to discover. So I hope that this um, this conference or this talk has inspired you guys to want to build and, and explore. And I don't want you guys to think that this thing is limited to just copper wire. It's not. Any any medium will work. For example, a tornado works on difference of, of uh, hot and cold air. Okay. It doesn't matter what the medium is, whether it's hot or cold air or, diff or uh, voltage differential. Okay. So just keep that in mind when you start uh, if you start to explore this technology. So with that in mind, uh, thank you all very much, and uh, we hope to uh, see some great inventions on YouTube. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, James Burdoff and Marco Roden. Thank you very much. Some ama truly amazing technology.